Welcome to this QuestMed SPA tutorial. My name is Yezin, and today we will be reviewing how to approach single best answer questions in rheumatology. Rheumatology involves a lot of multi-system disorders, so what we will be doing today will be to run through a number of key conditions you will be expected to know, and also how they relate to different parts of the curriculum, including surgery, general practice, statistics, and clinical pharmacology. So we hope it will allow you to broaden your learning and understand how each part of the curriculum integrates within itself and allows you to become a more knowledgeable clinician. Welcome to this QuestMed SBA tutorial. My name is Yezin, and today we will be reviewing how to approach single best answers in rheumatology. Rheumatology involves a number of multi-system disorders, so we will be going through a number of key conditions outlined here in the middle, and we will also try to understand how each of these disorders relates to common clinical scenarios we can face in surgery, general practice, statistics, and clinical pharmacology. So we hope it will broaden your horizons in terms of your medical knowledge and understand how rheumatology fits in within the medical curriculum. So let's start with the first question. If you'd like to pause the screen and read the question. So looking at this question, the answer here is metastatic cancer. So this is a 64 year old gentleman who comes in with a two week history of back pain between his shoulder blades. Also, he has had a history of prostate cancer, weight loss, and some mild tenderness in his thoracic spine. However, the neurological examination is normal. When you're looking at back pain, you need to understand that there are certain red flags that you need to look out for. In this particular scenario, the fact he's had a previous history of cancer is the first thing that should alarm you, the weight loss as well, and also the fact that there is thoracic back pain. So in the GP setting, we would often see patients coming in with lumbar back pain, and we would tend to ascribe it to um mechanical back pain on the most part. However, if we see any red flag features, we would consider further investigations going forward. So in this case, it doesn't look like it is mechanical back pain that we can just uh, tell the patient to go home and have some painkillers and consider physiotherapy. We do need to look into it a bit further. Looking at the other aspects and the choices. So we have disguises. So in this case, the fact he's apyrexial makes it less likely and also the fact that he doesn't have any risk factors for discitis. So that would include things like immunosuppression, and also people who inject intravenous drugs are also at higher risk. Ankylosing spondylitis, again, is less likely. Perhaps you might expect a slightly younger man, first of all, and we may expect a bit more history where the patient might have morning stiffness that gets better later in the day, and also you may have some other features associated with ankylosing spondylitis, such as joint pain, for example. And finally, spinal stenosis is less likely because you may expect a more positional element. So with spinal stenosis, that's related to narrowing of the spinal canal, which can lead to a number of clinical syndromes. But one thing that does come up a lot in exams is that with spinal stenosis, once you lean forward, it makes it feel, uh, it makes the pain better. So we didn't see much of that, so that makes it less likely. Therefore, with all that's going on, metastatic cancer is the correct answer here. So going through the red flags for back pain, we talked a lot about uh, the, the, worrying sin the worrying signs that we, we found earlier. However, I just wanted to run through a few more things that are uh, of note. So the key aspects that you should do, especially when you're examining, is to look for any neurological signs. So if someone has something like cauda equina syndrome, you may expect lower motor neuron signs because of damage to the cauda equina. Mm -hmm. However, if you have someone who has spinal cord compression, the spinal cord itself, you would expect upper motor neuron signs. So you would examine the arms and the legs just to make sure. And also you may look for any bower, bowel or bladder dysfunction and you may consider a rectal examination as well. There are a number of cancers that commonly metastasize to the bone. The mnemonic I use to remember this is BLT with a kosher pickle. That is breast, lung, thyroid, kidney, and prostate. 
And here's a link for you to have a look at some back pain notes so you can read about it in more detail. So have a look at the second question and pause the screen. So the answer here is anti-CCP. So let's look at this question. So we have a 34-year-old woman who has pain in the small joints and the wrist, and it's worse in the mornings. She has inflammation of the um, carbometacarpal joint, the metacarbophalangeal joint, and the proximal interphalangeal joints. Warm and tender, but no skin changes. So the question is really asking you to, tell, to, tell, to find out what the diagnosis is first, and then to know which antibody test is most specific. So if we, let, if we focus on the diagnosis, I think looking at this patient with a 34-year-old woman with wrist pain, I suppose the first thing we're thinking about is, could this be something like rheumatoid arthritis? And the thing that really points towards it is the fact that the proximal interphalangeal joints are affected. And this is important because in rheumatoid arthritis, you have a preference for the PIP joints to be affected, which is a distinction from other inflammatory arthritides, such as seronegative spondylar arthritides, which tend to affect the distal interphalangeal joints. So in future, if you see someone with proximal interphalangeal joint uh, dysfunction, you would likely point more towards rheumatoid arthritis rather than uh, spondylar negative arthritides. So the likely diagnosis here is rheumatoid arthritis. So the next question is going to be which of the antibody text tests are most specific. So looking at the choices below, anti-nuclear antibody is used um, in looking at a number of rheumatological conditions. The problem with anti-nuclear antibodies, it is quite sensitive. However, it's not specific. So it can be raised in a very uh, large number of rheumatological conditions. So it's not the right answer here. Again, rheumatoid factor, it is sensitive for rheumatoid arthritis. However, it is not particularly specific. And uh, in fact, the most specific is anti-CCP antibodies. And that's why it is the correct answer. The Looking at C, antibody screen likely to be negative. Again, we were talking earlier about the fact that sometimes you have seronegative spondylar arthritides um, that have negative antibody screens. And in that case, you may expect more likely for patients to have distal interphalangeal joint pain and tenderness. Uh, so that is less likely. And finally, for those who like obscure facts, antihistone antibodies are associated with drug-induced lupus. And again, in this scenario, we haven't heard of anything relating to someone taking any medications that are new. So again, that is less likely. So let's do another question uh, so we can talk a bit more about rheumatoid arthritis. So pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is Felty syndrome. So we have a 55-year-old woman with rheumatoid arthritis. She's felt more and well. Some coarse crackles are heard in the right upper zone, and dullness to percussion. So in that case, we're thinking, is there something in the lung? Could it be an infection? Could it be a pneumonia? Could it be something else? And then the spleen is palpable. Again, we wouldn't really expect a pneumonia on its own to cause splenomegaly. And we can see that there's an infection going on because there's a high temperature. The saturations are okay. And if you look at the blood test, the most striking thing here is that the neutrophils are quite low. So in effect, what we can see in front of us is we have someone with rheumatoid arthritis who has evidence of an infection, which may be related to low neutrophils, and also there is evidence of splenomegaly. And for those of you that have come across this syndrome, this is Felty syndrome. That is when you have the triad of rheumatoid arthritis and neutropenia and splenomegaly. So looking at the other answers here, pleurisy is less likely. So pleurisy relates to some inflammation of the lining of the lung, which wouldn't really explain the splenomegaly, for example. Again, the fact that there are coarse crackles that are heard in the right upper zone means that there's something going on inside the lung. Pneumonitis, it is possible this is pneumonitis, but again, we would expect that to be related to something like having methotrexate, for example. And again, we haven't really heard of anything there, and it wouldn't really be the unifying diagnosis. Pleural effusion is possible because we have an area that is dull to percussion. But again, the fact that there's splenomegaly not, wouldn't normally be related to a pleural effusion in that sense.
Amyloidosis can also cause splenomegaly, but it doesn't explain the other blood tests. And also, um, it wouldn't necessarily, we would also maybe see some kidney dysfunction, possibly. And again, really, it's just not the most likely diagnosis. So that's why the answer is Felty syndrome. So talking a bit more about rheumatoid arthritis, um, we talked about the PIP joints being affected. And as you may have come across in the past, there are multiple hand deformities. So on the top right, we can see evidence of ulnar deviation. And on the bottom right, we can see there is evidence of swan neck deformity, where there is flexion of the proximal interphalangeal joints, and there is extension uh, of the distal interphalangeal joints. So let's talk a bit more about rheumatoid arthritis, and it is a symmetrical polyarticular inflammatory arthritis, which tends to affect the pip joints as opposed to the dip, the distal interphalangeal joints. And as you might have come across in the past, there are multiple hand deformities. On that top right, we can see ulnar deviation. On the bottom right, we can see evidence of a swan neck deformity, where you get extension of the proximal interphalangeal joint and flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint. Whereas in the middle, there we can see evidence of Boutonniere's deformity, where you have flexion of the proximal interphalangeal joint, and you have extension of the distal interphalangeal joint. The other important aspect of rheumatoid arthritis in exams is that in surgery questions, there, they often say there is a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis who comes in for routine surgery. What should you do next? And the reason is because you can have something called atlantioaxial subluxation, which essentially means that there is some movement of the joint at C1 and C2, which can lead to some displacement and subsequent pressing on the spinal canal. And as you may expect in someone who's going to undergo surgery, you need to flex the head a bit to allow for intubation. And that may lead to um, some pretty disastrous consequences in the form of cord compression. So therefore, anyone who has a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis who's going for surgery should really have x-rays of the upper uh, cervical vertebra just to check for that com check for that syndrome uh, check for that uh, disorder so that uh, that can be looked into in a bit more detail and later on we'll talk a bit more about the extra articular features of rheumatoid arthritis so in blood tested rheumatoid arthritis uh, the first thing you need to do is to do a full blood count and going to that top right side we can see that there is a common exam question that comes up which is what are the causes of anemia and rheumatoid arthritis? And this is quite important, and it may come up in different scenarios where you are asked to, to figure out why this patient is anemic. And the reason for that is because it, there are quite a number of causes. So we said that anemia of chronic disease, um, we may have come across, it's common in lots of different disorders. However, in rheumatoid arthritis, it's common um, because you have evidence of um widespread inflammation, and you may expect a normocytic anemia to be related to anemia of chronic disease. However, what if you were to have a microcytic anemia? What could be the cause of that in rheumatoid arthritis? So thinking a bit more laterally, you may expect a patient to be on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which, as you might know, can be at higher risk for peptic ulcers or duodenal ulcers. So therefore, you may have an upper GI bleed secondary to non-steroidals, secondary to rheumatoid arthritis, which can cause a microcytic anemia. So you need to investigate it further. However, what about the cause of a macrocytic anemia in rheumatoid arthritis? And the most likely cause often is the fact that they are on methotrexate, which can cause a macrocytic anemia. So now you know, if someone asks you what the causes of anemia in rheumatoid arthritis would be, it would be these three main causes. So keep that uh, in your head if someone asks you that. As for inflammatory markers, they tend to be raised and you can use them to monitor disease severity. So this could be ESR, or CRP. And as we said earlier, that we have different antibodies that we use for rheumatoid arthritis, and that could be rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP. Anti-CCP is more specific. However, rheumatoid factor it, it tends to be positive in the normal population, 
But out of interest, it tends, if a patient is positive, they tend to have more systemic involvement and a worse prognosis. So that's just some uh, thing to take into consideration when you're thinking about rheumatoid factor. And as we're talking about statistics, uh, it's important to relate to you the importance of knowing the distinction between sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is the ability of a test to tell you correctly those who have the disease. So it's a true positive rate, whereas specificity is related to the true negative rate. So it's the ability of the test to identify those who don't have the disease. So if we put that into practice, you may have come across that a D-dimer which is um, used a lot in pulmonary embolism. It has a high sensitivity, which means that it can be raised in a lot of conditions, but it can be, but it can have poor specificity. And therefore, if it's negative, it's quite good because it's a true negative. And therefore, the likelihood is that they don't have a pulmonary embolism. However, if it's sensitive, if it's high, it is um, it's likely to show you that they have something, but you may not be 100% sure that it is a pulmonary embolism. Whereas rheumatoid factor has a high sensitivity, but a poor specificity in that same way, the most useful test is going to be the anti-CCP for rheumatoid arthritis, as we alluded to earlier. When you're doing investigations, you will have come across joint x-rays, which can be used a lot in osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, but also in someone who you may suspect has a fracture. And I think for osteoarthritis, you may have come across patients who have loss of joint space. Again, you can see that in rheumatoid arthritis as well. But what you see in rheumatoid arthritis, which you would not see in osteoarthritis, are these juxta-articular erosions, which you can see on that right-hand side. And of course, the soft tissue swelling, again, may be present in lots of other inflammatory disorders. But really try and look for these juxta-articular erosions as they may point you more towards a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. But in most cases, x-rays don't really make the diagnosis per se. It is just a helpful addition um, in the sense that it's really going to be the clinical scenario and also the antibodies that you use. So this is a uh, exam favorite talking about extra articular features in rheumatoid arthritis and as you can see there are a lot of features and it's important to distinguish them from other inflammatory disorders so we'll just talk through some key uh, aspects of them so i think the just on that top um, talking about systemic symptoms, you can get people who have low-grade fevers, weight loss, and fatigue, and that could indicate that their disease is progressed and they may need a bit more um, in terms of treatment or a review, at least in clinic, just to see if they need uh, some further treatments. Um, other than that, we talked a bit about anemia of chronic disease, splenomegaly, and on that bottom right, we can talk a bit more about rheumatoid nodules. So rheumatoid nodules are these subcutaneous nodules that can exist anywhere really, but they tend to um, happen more in the, in the elbow, around the elbow, and that's why you look at the elbow in an exam um, and when you're doing your clinical examination of the hands, so you make sure not to miss that very important part of the hand examination. And also you can have Raynaud syndrome where you have color change in the hands and Looking at that uh, left-hand side, where it's important to understand how rheumatoid arthritis can affect the lungs and also the heart. So you have pleural effusions, pulmonary fibrosis, and pleurisy, as we mentioned earlier, and that can affect different parts of the lung. And um, talking as well about the heart, yes, you can have pericardial effusions, which uh, are less common than um, others, but you can certainly have them. But I think the most important effect of rheumatoid arthritis on cardiovascular disease is going to be this idea that you have an increased cardiovascular risk, and therefore you're more likely to have ischemic heart disease, and you're more likely to have myocardial infarction. So therefore, an exam favorite is the cause of chest pain in rheumatoid arthritis. So as you can see here, you can have a lot of things that can cause chest pain. So pericardial effusions, you can have a heart attack, you can have angina, you can get a pleural effusion, you can get pleurisy. So there are many, many different causes of chest pain. So you, and if you think about someone who has rheumatoid arthritis, you may think about the more obscure things like a pericardial effusion, of course, but don't forget 
common things like cardiovascular disease. And finally, uh, peripheral neuropathy is very important, and you can get something called a mononeuritis multiplex, where you can get different nerve lesions in different parts of the body, which are apparently individual and not related to each other. So you can either get a peripheral neuropathy, as you might see where you have some sensory disturbance on its own, or you can get these different disorders around the body. And finally, rheumatoid arthritis can cause osteoporosis, and therefore you may want to treat someone with bisphosphonate if they have rheumatoid arthritis to try and alleviate the consequences of osteoporosis, which can be things like hip fractures, for example, which can lead to quite a lot of further complications. So let's have a look at the next question. So please pause the screen and have a read. So this is a 34-year-old um, man, and the key here is that he is 34 years old, um, and keep that in mind when we talk about it in a second. So you have a paresthesia in the fingertips, there are some dilated capillaries at the nail beds, there are no color changes the fingertips, but there's a demarcated line beyond which his fingertips turn pale in the cold weather. And there's cramping pain in the sole of the feet, there's a smoking history, and there are no pedal pulses. So it's it's a bit odd, I think, that you'd expect a very young man like that to have what sounds like vascular disease. So cramping pain in the sole of the feet, the pedal pulses are absent. However, the fact is that he has quite a significant smoking history. So you may have come across this syndrome before, but if you don't, now you know about it. So the answer is Berger's disease, which is a syndrome that is associated often with young men who have an extensive smoking history that leads to a vasculitis, which is not an inflammatory vasculitis per se, but it just leads to occlusions in certain areas. And this can lead to either chronic ischemia or it can lead to acute ischemia. I don't really want to go into the uh, other uh, distractors, so erythromyalgia and cryo globulinemia, uh, it's a bit complicated. And I think a good rule of thumb is if you haven't come across it before, it's probably not going to be that important. And because a lot of medical schools nowadays are trying to focus on more core conditions rather than uh, things that are a bit more obscure. But I think the reason that Berger's disease remains to be something that is examined is because it has a nice sort of relationship between rheumatology and vascular disease as well. So it, it's, it serves as a nice learning point, I suppose. Um, with cervical rib, um, that can cause, that can be related to an extra rib, which you can have from birth, which can push onto one of the nerves and can lead to paresthesia. Again, it's less likely here. And then Raynaud's disease, it could possibly be Raynaud's disease, but it sort of doesn't explain the other stuff. So the cramping pain in the sole of the feet and the pedal pulses being absent. You wouldn't expect with Raynaud's disease to have absent pulses because it doesn't affect the arteries in that way. So talking a bit more about Berger's disease, uh, as we were talking about earlier, you're really um, talking about this disorder of young men who smoke and they can have acute or chronic ischemia. And you may want to do arterial Dopplers and angiograms just to look for the occlusions. And really, you are trying to manage it with smoking cessation. For your purposes, the answer is always going to be smoking cessation. And if you want to know more, you can also give other vasoactive medications such as nifedipine. And if there is critical ischemia, you may want to consider someone for hospital admission and surgical management. But for your purposes, the management is always going to be smoking cessation to start off with, and then everything else gets a bit more specialist. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. So let's look at the next question. So the 75-year-old uh, woman comes to the emergency department with pain in her wrist. So if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is pseudogout. So you have a 75-year-old with pain in her wrist, and it's sort of subacute. We don't actually know much else about how she is in terms of if she is febrile, uh, if she is really, really unwell, because that would be important. But the key is that she has a history of hemochromatosis. And I guess in the exam world, you should really sort of figure out why the question is telling you something. So in this scenario, the question is telling you hemochromatosis and wrist pain. 
And there is a very strong relationship between hemochromatosis and pseudogout, which makes it the most likely diagnosis. If the question was to ask you which of the following should be is most important to be excluded first, the answer is much, much more likely to be septic arthritis. Um, and finally, uh, if we were to talk about the um, other two uh, polyarticular disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, again, we wouldn't expect it just that in one wrist. Osteoarthritis, again, could be in one wrist, for example. Um, you may expect a bit more of a long, uh, long uh, gradual worsening rather than just over two weeks, and it can affect any joint, basically. But again, it doesn't really fit in the sense that it would, you would expect a more chronic course, and that's why the most likely diagnosis here is going to be pseudogout. So talking about uh, disorders that can lead to a monoarthritis, gout is probably the one that you're most familiar with. And it is related to an overproduction or under excretion of uric acid. And it can lead to deposition in the joint. And the on looking at these images on that right-hand side, in the chronic form can lead to what we call gouty tophus. And this can exist either, as you can see here on the knee, or on the elbow and also behind the ears. And again, in your clinical examination, that's why you should always look behind the ears whether or not there's any evidence of a gouty tophus. And we would expect someone to be a bit older, uh, to be male, and the risk factors that are important would be renal disease, obesity, and also diuretics. So the a common culprit would be something like a thiazide diuretic. So if someone who has just been started on thiazide diuretic who has joint pain, you would expect them to possibly have gout and investigate based on that. So you have this exquisitely painful joint and it can affect a lot of different joints as we said. And the important thing if you are doing a joint aspirate is that you're looking for needle-shaped negatively birefringent urate crystals. So if you look at that picture on the right hand side, you can see that it is needle shaped and therefore it's most likely to be gout. There are, of course, different distinctions between something that is negatively and positively birefringent. And I've tried to look into this as a past as a medical student in the past as a medical student, but I've always been a bit confused. So the way I've always remembered it was that if it looks needle shaped, it's much more likely to be gout, whereas if it looks like a rhomboid, it's much more likely to be pseudogout. And equally, in, if it's written as in, in text as negatively birefringent, I remember it as mono, monosodium urate is negative, pyrophosphate is positive. That's a nice way of remembering what is gout and what is pseudogout in the context of a joint aspirate. If you're managing gout acutely, you may start off with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which can be quite useful. Um, however, if someone who has renal disease, for example, you may want to consider them to, or to you may want to consider colchicine. Also, if they're on anticoagulants, you may uh, want to avoid uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because they can also precipitate further bleeding. And if all of these aren't tolerated, you may also consider corticosteroids or intraarticular injections only after septic arthritis is excluded. You could use prophylaxis as well if you have recurrent gout episodes and really it's about lifestyle modification to start off with ensure that you reduce alcohol intake and pure and rich foods thiazide and loop diuretics you can avoid them if you can and you would want to start a medication called allopurinol and you would really want to try and start it after a attack has resolved and one key point is that if you have an acute attack, you shouldn't stop allopurinol, you should continue it. And um, you can, of course, make sure that um, if they have any further episodes, you may want to consider giving them other uh, acute treatments like we talked about earlier. So let's look at another question, if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is onycholysis. So we have a 45 year old female. She has joint pain. She has redness and swelling affecting the distal interphalangeal joints. Fine, so we're thinking about something different here. Early morning stiffness, again, 
and we have important because it may be more likely to be autoimmune and we have a raised dry rash on the extensor surfaces of her knees okay so really just based on the fact that it's affecting the distal interphalangeal joints it is much more likely to be a seronegative spondular arthropathy compared to rheumatoid arthritis so that really excludes a and then if we look at the other options cotron's papules is relating to dermatomyositis which can be uh, a cause of joint pain but also a rash but you wouldn't really expect that particular rash i mean if i was to just read that rash on its own a raised dry rash on the extensor surfaces of the knees i'd probably be thinking something more along the lines of psoriasis we'll talk a bit more about dermatomyositis later a gouty tophus, um, less likely, I suppose, because you may expect someone to have chronic gout. Again, you wouldn't really expect the rash in that sense, and therefore it's not the most likely diagnosis. And joint crepitus, it is, it can be a bit non-specific. I suppose osteoarthritis classically is most associated with the joint crepitus, but I wouldn't say that joint crepitus is supportive of the most likely diagnosis in this scenario. And that kind of leaves you with onycholysis, which you may know is a, a common, a relate, there's a common relationship between onycholysis and psoriatic arthritis, which makes sense because there is a distal interphalangeal joint being affected, which is related to seronegative spondular arthrotides, which is of which psoriatic arthritis is one of them. And again, that explains this raised dry rash on the extensor surfaces. So looking at this picture, you can see that there is separation of the nails from the nail bed, and it just looks a bit distorted, and that is onycholysis, and it can actually also be related to fungal infections. But again, in this context earlier, in the rheumatological context, it can be related to psoriatic arthritis in another sense. So looking at the seronegative spondylar arthropathies, there are a group of disorders that are seronegative, i.e. they don't have any antibodies that are positive. And we have four main disorders that you can see here, and they are, tend to be a spectrum. So sometimes you can have different disorders that seem to join up with each other. So you may have um, someone with ankylosing spondylitis that may have some uh, element of, for example, inflammatory bowel disease that is related to that sort of orthopathy. So they sort of mix and match at some particular occasions. And so that's why you may expect in a rheumatologic, rheumatology clinic, you need to make sure to have a good understanding of the clinical syndrome so you can monitor for any changes going forward. So ankylosing spondylitis, the key is that you have a youngish, maybe in the 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, male who tends to have back pain that's worse in the mornings and you can also have some extra articular features in the eyes aortitis as well so you may want to uh, be very worried of someone who has ankylosing spondylitis has chest pain and you can also get apical pulmonary fibrosis and you can treat initially with um anti-inflammatory drugs but also physiotherapy and subsequently if that doesn't work you may consider more uh, stronger uh, treatments such as uh, biologic therapies such as infliximab. Um, equally with um, reactive arthritis, you will have come across it in, in the past where someone, for example, comes, uh, the classic exam scenario is a uh, someone returning from a business trip in, Tha in Thailand, for example, and they come home with arthritis. And, and that is this sort of reactive arthritis that can be triggered by someone who has chlamydia, for example. And equally, it can be the same in someone who has a, a bout of salmonella, and they have subsequently, they have arthritis, and they have urethritis, um, and they have conjunctivitis. So that sort of reactive arthritis tends to be treated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and they, a lot of them tend to get better, but some of them, of course, will not. Um, but it tends to be a more acute scenario. As for enteropathic arthropathy, that tends to describe the relationship between joint pain and inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And again, you may treat depending on trying to control the um, inflammatory bowel disease, or you may want to consider further treatments to dampen down the immune system. And finally, with psoriatic arthritis, uh, the as we were talking about earlier, the DIP joints commonly involved and you may want to try again to dampen down the immune response with uh, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs.
And just to, to conclude this section, seronegative spondylar arthropathy is one of the uh, most important uh, thing that, uh, things that really combines these disorders is the fact that they have a HLA B27, which essentially is a MHC um, class protein, which is found on the um, lymphocytes, and that is tends to be what brings them all together. But it's not required for the diagnosis. It's just something that uh, is in association, as it were. So HLA-B27 positive patients who have joint pain, you really need to be thinking about this group of disorders, seronegative spondylar arthropathies. So just looking at a few more images, if you want to pause the screen and have a think about what each of these could point towards. So on that left-hand side, you have the bamboo spine, which is associated with ankylosing spondylitis. And you can see here that you have a connection somehow between the um, between each vertebra. And that tends to be related to inflammation of the areas around them. And therefore, it looks like a bamboo, um, a piece of bamboo, and we call it bamboo spine. So ankylosing spondylitis. Whereas in the middle, keratoderma blinneragicum, that is more associated with reactive arthritis. This is a very common image that uh, is used in Wikipedia and was also present in my own exams. So uh, just to know that if it looks like you have this brownish sort of discoloration on the soles of the feet, think about something like reactive arthritis. And on that right-hand side, you have a phenomenon called dactylitis, which can be present in a lot of the seronegative spondylar arthropathies. And that essentially is also called a sausage joint, where you have inflammation of the whole uh, toe, for example, which can lead to contraction and deformity of the toe itself. And again, you may also see, just as an aside, there are some nail bed changes here, which could also be related to this um, seronegative disease. So let's look at a, another question. So if you would like to pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is muscle biopsy. And the point here is that I'd like you to make sure to read the question stem. In, in this case, it's asking which of the following investigations will most likely reveal the diagnosis. So it's asking you a very, very specific thing. So you have someone with disabling proximal muscle weakness. There's no skin involvement. Sensation reflexes are unaffected, and essentially nothing else is affected apart from this reduced power um, and tenderness to palpation. So really we're thinking, is there a muscle problem that we're thinking about? And this question is trying to really m figure out, do you know how to use different investigations and what they mean? So I guess... If we look at creatine kinase, uh, you may have come across it in the context of rhabdomyolysis, where you have muscle breakdown, usually secondary to trauma, and, and that can be uh, very, very raised in certain disorders. But again, it's not really going to reveal the diagnosis for you in that sense, whereas um, muscle biopsy is much more likely to show you what the diagnosis is because you have a very good understanding of what's in front of you. And I think the key here is that you... You would also always try to start off with a non-invasive um, investigation to start off with, and subsequently you will hone it down on the more invasive. Because obviously, if you try to take a muscle biopsy, although it, usually it's fine, but can be relating to bleeding, infection, pain. So you try to avoid the invasive stuff unless you absolutely have to. And equally looking at the other stuff, so aldolase is an enzyme that can be raised. It can be raised in lots of muscle disorders, so won't likely to reveal the diagnosis. Electromyography is when you take recordings from the muscle. It just tends to show muscle damage rather than it actually being um, diagnostic. And also an ESR is a very broad uh, way of figuring out, figuring out if someone has evidence of inflammation. So it won't reveal the diagnosis. So really, if you just read the question where you're trying to find out what is most likely to reveal the diagnosis, then probably you would think muscle biopsy is your best bet. So, But if it was the next best investigation, it may be something simpler, like one of the blood tests we mentioned. So with polymyositis and dermatomyositis, those are two disorders that 
to a certain extent come hand in hand. And the differentiation between them is that dermatomyositis is associated with a rash, whereas polymyositis doesn't have a rash. And basically what you have is this primary sort of muscle disorder that uh, it tends to be proximal and it can be associated with pain and weakness and no sort of sensation loss or changes in your reflexes. And with dermatomyositis, there are two key findings that you would find. So here you see on this left-hand side, the heliotope rash, which is this purplish rash found on the outside of the eyelids. Whereas on this right-hand side, you can see cotrons papules. And that is when you have these, again, purplish uh, it's purplish lesions on the knuckles um, and on the extensive surface of the hand. So the, the the key thing as well is that if you have someone with dermatomyositis or polymyositis, you should always look for any underlying malignancy because uh, the numbers vary, but perhaps in 20% of patients who have these disorders, there may be some underlying malignancy as a paraneoplastic syndrome. So therefore, you may want to do a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, or a PET scan, depending on your local policy. But generally, always try and look for any malignancy that underlies this. So let's look at the next question, if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So here you see that you have a different sort of question. Which of the following is the next best investigation? So we have a 42-year-old woman who has fatigue, joint pain, and has a rash on returning from a holiday in Spain. And in the exam world, that is code for she's been under the sun, Therefore, this is a photosensitive rash with well-demarcated rash with scales on her face and neck. So we have someone with who is a 42-year-old woman with fatigue, joint pain, and a photosensitive rash. And in that case, you should really be thinking, is this lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus? So with that in mind, what is the next best investigation? So this is important what other things would you expect in someone who has lupus? And the reason the answer here is urine dip is because renal disease is a very common um, side effect of lupus. And therefore, a urine dip will find out, help you find out if there's evidence of proteinuria or hematuria and will allow you to do some more investigations going forward. But actually, even if you look at the other sort, the other special, the other uh, test that you might do, they probably won't be that helpful to you. So an echocardiogram might be useful if she has any chest pain or shortness of breath, um, but not wouldn't be the next best investigation. 24-hour urine collection, not really that useful in this scenario. Um, so it's a bit of a distractor here. Uh, skin biopsy, it wouldn't, if you have a photosensitive rash, you it wouldn't really show you that much because the um, it may show you some possibly some uh, immune cells, but actually it wouldn't help you to make the diagnosis and it wouldn't be the next best investigation in any case because you would try to do other things further, maybe blood tests, antibodies, and also the urine that we mentioned earlier. And again, blood and urine cultures. So cultures are more important if you think someone has an infection, but in this scenario, you wouldn't really expect her to have an infection as it's more likely to be something like an autoimmune disease. So let's talk a bit more about lupus and the clinical features of lupus. So you can see here that you've got a quite a wide variety of, of uh, clinical features. So you may have watched House in the past when they say it's never lupus, uh, even though in some cases it can be lupus, I suppose, but you really make, have to make sure to investigate um, in the right way and not go all the way down uh, your um, your antibodies first. You sort of need to make sure to take a good history, good examination, and then take your general blood test and, and then antibodies and then go for um, particular investigations that are a bit more specialist. So I guess the, the key thing in the history is to, to look at whether or not they have this general fever, depression, malaise, sort of not really themselves. You can get skin disorders. You can get similar chest dead disorders, such as the way you saw in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, renal disease is common, and you can get hematological dysfunction with anemia, um, lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, and also this sort of neurological disorder. You can get seizures, ataxia, and headache as well.
So the only other thing I want to mention is that sometimes, um, which can come up in exams sometimes, you can get a joint deformity that can look like rheumatoid arthritis, and this is called Jacquot's arthropathy. So this is why it's important to make sure to know how to uh, interpret antibodies, because in this scenario, you may have a patient who has joint disease that looks a lot like rheumatoid arthritis, but it's not. It's actually lupus. So that's why it's important to know how to interpret your investigations going forward. So your antibodies, so we talked about anti-nuclear antibody earlier, that is a rather non-specific um, uh, antibody that can be raised in a lot of different things. So the key antibodies really are going to be the anti-double-stranded DNA and the anti-Smith antibody as well. And those are the um, very highly specific antibodies for lupus and tends to confirm the diagnosis for you. And also the double-stranded DNA antibodies can be markers of disease activity. So those are the most useful antibodies to make this diagnosis. So the management, it does depend on your severity of the disease. And this is probably not going to be as important for you as medical students, but it's good to just have an understanding of how wide the uh, the spectrum is for how bad it can be. So in someone who doesn't have that much uh, in the way of symptoms, you may consider to start them on just non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, hydroxychloroquine as well, and short courses of steroids. And as you get more serious, you may consider disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And you can also have very serious flares that can cause renal disease, neurological disease, hematological effects. And you may require lots of corticosteroids and immunosuppressants like cyclophosphamide, for example. But this is just to just give you an understanding that it can be very, very severe and it can be quite mild and you would treat accordingly. The next question, if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So the important aspect of this question is it's trying to differentiate between two key conditions. So you have a 30-year-old man who is that the, the important thing here is that he's quite young, first of all, and he has what sounds like lung disease, but also some kidney disease. So he's got some shortness of breath, he's got hematuria, he's got crackles, he doesn't look very well and he's got raised urea and creatinine. So you've got lung disorder and possible renal failure. So the two main conditions that you're looking are looking for would be what would be C anchor disease, which would be um, granulomatosis with polyangitis, or you would also consider anti-GBM, so glomerular basement membrane antibodies. So the other disorders, uh, the other uh, antibodies that we we're talking about would be ANA, wouldn't be so important here. The uh, perinuclear anti antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibody disorder wouldn't necessarily be uh, related to this. That more looks a bit more like asthma with some renal dysfunction. And finally, E, anti streptolysin O, again, is less likely. That is more related to someone who has uh, streptococcus disorder and some autoimmune dysfunction secondary to that. So um, just to talk a bit about the this, what we would call rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. So what we were talking about, the C anchor, that in the past used to be known as Wegener's granulomatosis, is granulomatosis with polyangitis. And what you have is this upper airway and lower airway lesions and also renal dysfunction. So the differentiator tends to be that they tend to be a bit older so usually men may be in their 50s or their 60s, and also they will have upper airway disease. So in the early stages, they may have just a stuffy nose that's just not going away. And later on, they can have full-on erosion of their septum, for example. So for example, you may want to ask if they uh, do any cocaine, for example, because that would be a differential. But essentially what happens is you can have a full uh, a essentially erosion of that of around the nose, you can have collapse of the nasal bridge. And um, the second disorder we were talking about is P. anchor, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. We were saying asthma, it looks a bit like asthma, um, and you also have a very raised eosinophil count. And finally, you have this anti glomerular basement membrane antibody disease. And here we can find patients with pulmonary hemorrhage associated with renal failure and 
Uh, this is also called good pasture syndrome. And the I think the key differentiator here between this and C anchor disease would be the um, the fact that you can have younger patients who have it, and also you would not expect patients to have this upper airway nasal disorder that you would find in the C anchor disease. So looking at these images on that left-hand side, you can see this, this patchy consolidation, uh, which um, is this uh, can be consistent with granulomatosis with polyangitis, C anchor disease, whereas um, uh, you could expect similar things in terms of a pulmonary hemorrhage as well. So it doesn't really help you, I suppose, that much there, the chest x-ray, but it's just good to know how it might look like. But really on this right-hand side, you can see this is what we call the saddle nose. So this uh, erosion in the nose and this collapse of the nasal bridge. And that's what you might expect in granulomatosis with polyangitis. And just to illustrate a few points about drugs that are used in rheumatology. So if you want to pause the screen and just have a think to yourself what the these uh, drugs, the side effects are, and then we'll go through them in a second. So uh, this is a uh, readout from uh, our notes on the website and uh, a useful mnemonic as you might know I do like mnemonics you can use corticosteroids to remember the side effects of corticosteroids so uh, I think for in clinical practice um, the things you need to ensure to follow up patients who started with corticosteroids is you should check their blood pressure make sure that's controlled check for any diabetes because steroids can certainly trigger onset of diabetes um, and also you may want to treat for osteoporosis and finally you may also want to treat someone with omeprazole lanzoprazole which is a protein pump inhibitor as there is a higher risk of peptic ulcers in corticosteroids as well. With methotrexate, if you're starting someone on this drug, you may want to do a chest x-ray to start off with, spirometry, and also you may want to, or you, you definitely need to tell patients that they should not get pregnant on methotrexate because it is a very potent teratogen. Sulfazalazine, uh, again, the key is myelosuppression, so I mean, you need to do a regular blood test to have a look to see if there's any evidence of uh, abnormalities in their white cells. Hydroxychloroquine, and the main one is rash. Biologic therapies, so we use a lot of etanercept, infliximab. Immunosuppression, so this sort of uh, idea that people are having a high risk of infections, but also this reactivation of tuberculosis. So you may need to check if someone has tuberculosis um, in, before you start someone on this therapy. And gold is just put down here for reference. Uh, we don't use it very often now in rheumatological disorders. So quickly reviewing rashes. If you want to pause the screen and have a think about what each of these uh, rashes represent. So on this left-hand side, uh, this is uh, erythema nodosum, uh, which is a, just, uh, characterized by a painful sort of bumpy rash that can be present on the shins here. And uh, on this bottom right, this is erythema multiforme, which uh, looks a bit sort of like, uh, sometimes can be described as a bullseye appearance, which is, can be look a bit like Lyme disease, but uh, it's a bit more sort of widespread and looks slightly different from Lyme disease. And at the top, this is pyoderma gangrenosum, which classically is associated with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. But again, as we said earlier, you have seronegative spondylar arthropathies that can be related to inflammatory bowel disease. So this can coincide with that as well. So in keeping with our dermatological understanding of uh, rheumatology, this sort of thing can come up. So erythema nodosum, uh, the most common cause is actually having no cause, so idiopathic. But uh, the, the, in the exam scenario, you can have patients with who, young patients with on the oral contraceptive pill, people with sarcoidosis. Again, that can sometimes cause joint pains that can make things a bit tricky and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's as well. Whereas erythema multiforme, that is a hypersensitivity reaction. And a lot of exam questions will ask you, what is the most likely cause? And the most likely cause is herpes simplex. And of course, there are other causes. And, and that's, a, that's a, a common question that does come up. So just make sure to commit that to memory. So uh, if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read, 
So this is an 81 year old man who has double vision, jaw pain and malaise, and he's febrile and appears unwell, and he has tenderness over the right temple. So you should really be thinking about giant cell arteritis in the first instance, because he has jaw pain, his malaise, um, and tenderness of the right temple. You're thinking, is there any inflammation in the artery supplying the eye, which is causing all uh, this? Another disorder, which you could be in your differential diagnosis, uh, and it's uh, talked about a bit, I suppose, in the choices here, is, is could he be having a stroke or a transient ischemic attack? Um, it is less likely to be that because you wouldn't really expect things like the jaw pain and also appearing unwell and tenderness of the right temple. So that makes urgent CT scan and aspirin 300 milligrams um, incorrect. Um, so it really depends on how fast you need to be in order to treat this. So what is the single best next step? That's the key question here. So really in giant cell arthritis, you need to treat early. So you give prednisolone as a stat dose and then continue on until they are seen by the rheumatologist. So that makes A incorrect because you wouldn't just refer going forward. You would treat them straight away and uh, you would, they would uh, go ahead with that and treat accordingly. So the temporal artery biopsy is important because you want to make the diagnosis if possible. Um, and however, the problem with the temporal artery biopsy sometimes is that it can be um, negative and that the reason for that is because you can have skip lesions where you biopsy an area and uh, the, in that particular area there's no evidence of any inflammation and it can be falsely negative. So a lot of times we rely on the clinical syndrome and if the clinical syndrome fits and there's evidence of inflammation usually by doing a erythrocyte sedimentation rate, an ESR, if that is raised and the clinical syndrome is there we would treat refer to rheumatology, and then also refer for a temporal artery biopsy. But if it's negative and the clinical syndrome still matches, we are likely to continue treatment and see if the patient gets better on steroids. So this vasculitis of the large cerebral arteries, it occurs in association with polymyalgia rheumatica, which we will talk about in a second. And really, we would uh, treat GCA uh, with uh, prednisolone. Sometimes we may give IV methylprednisolone in the early stages and then continue with oral prednisolone. And really, as we were talking about earlier, with steroids, you may give bisphosphonates for osteoporosis and a protein pump inhibitor is recommended as well for the reasons we discussed earlier. And for those of you who don't like histology, like me, uh, you can see on this right-hand side if you um, maybe trust me with this, that there is some evidence of narrowing of the artery. There's not really much in the way of the lumen, and there's a lot of inflammation, as you can see by lots of black dots, which will likely be lymphocytes. So a good rule of thumb that I always found in medical school looking at histology is that if there are lots of black dots, it's probably lymphocytes, and it's probably inflammation. So that's a, a way that I used to, to look through questions. And it worked quite well to a certain extent. But obviously, um, perhaps you may want to, to try and familiarize yourself with how different things look on histology. But certainly, if you see lots of black dots, think lymphocytes and think autoimmune in the first instance. So looking at polymyalgia rheumatica, um, you can uh, understand here that it's a vasculitis uh, and it occurs only in the elderly. So in this scenario, it's most things are you, in medicine are not only in the elderly, but polymyalgia rheumatica is one of those few things that, you know, the vast, vast, vast majority are in the sort of 60, 70, 80 age range uh, rather than, and it doesn't really happen in the young, basically. And you get this severe pain and stiffness in the shoulders. So it can be sort of sudden onset, they sort of all of a sudden, or can be gradual as well. And uh, it can be in the shoulders, the arms, and in the um, in the waist as well, and the, the hips. And it's worse in the morning, and it gets better, it tends to be over the rest of the day. And this high ESR, CRP, anemia of chronic disease, as we can get in a lot of inflammatory disorders. And then if they have giant cell arthritis, we may do a temporal artery biopsy to uh, uh, find out if they do have this very much related disorder. So thank you for listening to uh, this lecture. 
We hope you find it useful and we hope you now appreciate the key disorders you need to know about and how they relate to different aspects of the medical curriculum. So here are some free resources from QuestMed. You can have a look at our QuestBook, which is a free book of notes covering more than 600 medical topics. Follow us on Instagram for daily single best answer questions with detailed explanations. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, QuestMed Tutorials, for regular SBA tutorials, uh, mainly focused on exams and also focus on key subjects you need to know for your medical training. So uh, thanks for listening and we hope you find this useful and the best of luck with all your exams and hopefully we'll see you soon for our next video.